HHS and, Catholic, and the Catholic Church examining the politicization of grants, a minority day hearing. The Oversight Committee's mission statement is, we exist to secure two fundamental principles. First, Americans have a right to know that the money Washington takes from them is well spent. And second, Americans deserve an efficient, effective government that works for them. Our duty on the Oversight and Government Reform Committee is to protect these rights. Our solemn responsibility is to hold government accountable to taxpayers because taxpayers have a right to know what they get from their government. We will work tirelessly in partnership with citizen watchdogs to deliver the facts to the American people and bring genuine reform to the Federal bureaucracy. This is our mission statement. Pursuant to the request by the minority, today is a minority hearing. For that reason, I will uh, ask the ranking member to begin by making his opening statement. The gentleman from Maryland is recognized. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank you very much for agreeing to hold today's Minority Day of Hearing so quickly after our full committee hearing on December 1st. I would also like to extend my thanks to your staff for their cooperation in scheduling this hearing and working with us to accommodate today's witnesses. I am very grateful for all of these efforts. The reason I feel so strongly about today's hearing is because I want to make sure our committee gives a voice to the victims of human trafficking, forced prostitution, and sexual slavery. In our last hearing, we invited only witnesses from the Department of Health and Human Services who discussed the formal procedures for grant applications. We were missing witnesses who could testify in more detail about who these victims are, what they go through, and why reproductive health services are so critical for their recovery. Unfortunately, at the last hearing, several members of the Republican side accused HHS of having an anti-Catholic bias. They argued that HHS should have awarded a grant to the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops, even though the bishops refused to allow any grant funds to be used for family planning services such as abortion and contraceptives. At the last hearing, George Sheldon, the principal HHS witness, testified that he made his decision based on what was, and I quote, in the best interest of these victims, unquote. He explained that referrals for reproductive health services were critical for these victims. He, he stated, and I quote, I have talked to victims as well as experts in this field who have indicated that referral for the full range of gynecological services is an appropriate requirement for these individuals who have been victimized and forced into prostitution. He also said this, ultimately, it is, it is that victim that we are trying to empower. It is the victim that will decide what services they will avail themselves to or what services they will deny. If our goal is to analyze this grant program in a responsible manner, we cannot ignore the voices of these human trafficking victims, many of whom are very young women who have been exploited and raped by their persecutors. For these reasons, I am very thankful that Ms. Flory Burke and Ms. Andrea Powell are here today to share their experiences in helping these victims escape their exploitative uh, conditions and put their lives back together. They will explain why these victims need a full range of referral services that includes reproductive health services, and they will explain why limits placed on those referrals fail to meet the needs of trafficking victims they serve on a daily basis. I would also like to enter into the record with unanimous consent a statement that was submitted by a coalition of nearly two dozen organizations in support of comprehensive reproductive health information and services for female victims of human trafficking. These organizations all fully support HHS's decision. Without objection, so ordered. Finally, Mr. Chairman, at the broadest level, I believe Congress should do as much as possible to enhance uh, efforts to combat human trafficking and sexual exploitation. Indeed, at our last hearing, you stated that this is an area where, quote, there is never enough attention by Congress. Uh, end of quote. And I really do thank you, and I know you are very concerned about this issue, uh, and, I, and I know of your work in the past with regard to it. And I hope we can work together in a bipartisan manner. And I believe I speak for the entire committee when I commend our witnesses for the work that each of them performs. And with that, I yield back. I thank the gentleman. I will now recognize myself for an abbreviated opening statement. I join with the ranking member in believing that, in fact, victims deserve the best services providers can offer. On December 1st, our hearing focused on the action by HHS political appointees in what we believed to be an abuse of the grant process. 
It may well be, as your uh, unanimous consent uh, indicates, and many of the statements made last week, that a full range of health care, uh, reproductive health care solutions may be needed. Notwithstanding that, the, the previous hearing showed clearly that, in fact, in the grant process, HHS, knowing full well that under Catholic theology, they could not provide those services that they ultimately decided to deny the grant on. That is why the committee's hearing did concentrate on Catholicism, a religious belief which includes a prohibition on contraception or abortion, uh, found themselves rated with an 89 with five years of successful, uh, and we may hear differently today, but we didn't uh, previous weeks, successful execution of this contract. Having said that, the law is clear. Denying based on religious beliefs is prohibited under the law. Last or two weeks ago, the grant process abuse appeared to clearly deny based on that. There certainly well, were well demonstrated opportunities for, the, for HHS to find workarounds, allowing for those individuals to receive, when they were receiving ordinary health care treatment from licensed physicians, to receive referrals or some other accommodation. That was not explored. It did not come to mind. And ultimately, uh, the, uh, the process was left to ask Catholic bishops to say how they would pay for abortions and pretend not to. Ultimately, they could not do that. It would be outside the teachings of their faith and prohibited. Therefore, today's hearing, although it will concentrate on, and rightfully so, shedding light on these victims, and I uh, approve the, a wide variety of questions that will undoubtedly be asked, and I have seen the witnesses' uh, opening testimony, and I understand that it will concentrate on the victims. This series of hearings on grant abuse will continue asking not whether a particular policy or ideology is the case, but rather, under the current law, was a grant properly executed based on a system that is predictable and accountable to the taxpayers. Having said that, although I don't believe uh, that will be the case and nothing will change that today, I join with the ranking member in recognizing that we have a panel of human rights advocates who are here today to inform us further on a problem which this committee on a bipartisan basis wants to explore. With that, I yield back and would now like to recognize, without taking a breath, our first panel. Ms. Burke is a consultant for anti-human trafficking, human rights and collaborations, and is chair emeritus of Freedom Network USA. Ms. Uh, Andrea Powell is executive director and co-founder of Fair Girls. Ladies, uh, pursuant to the committee rules, I would ask that you please now rise to take the oath. And please raise your right hands. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth? Let the record indicate both witnesses added answered in the affirmative. Please take your seats. I am going to tell you this is my first minority hearing, but fortunately it is not my first time to the rodeo. Everything is the same in a minority hearing as it is in any other hearing. So uh, you will have a green light in front of you, a countdown. Uh, please understand that both of your opening statements will be placed in the record completely. So abbreviate, go off of it, quite frankly, extend or tell us things that were not in your statement, and you will be adding to the information we have. Uh, when it gets to the end of five minutes, please try to wrap up as expeditiously as possible. Ms. Burke. Chairman Issa, Representative Cummings, distinguished members of Congress and staff, <clears throat> thank you for the invitation to provide testimony. Excuse me. <clears throat> regarding the reproductive health needs of survivors of human trafficking. Thank you also for your interest and ongoing commitment to the services for victims. I have been working with these survivors since 1997. Since that time, I have worked providing direct services, creating programs, supervising staff, and now as an independent consultant to both governmental and nongovernmental entities. 
I also serve as an expert witness and am asked to testify on the psychological impact of human trafficking and the climate of fear that surrounds the victims of this horrendous crime. Additionally, I provide training on victim-centered care, both nationally and internationally. During the various aspects of my work, I have had the privilege of interviewing hundreds of survivors of human trafficking, and it is this direct experience that informs the remarks I will make today and in my written testimony. My intent is to convey the accounts provided to me by survivors in their own words, not based on theory, supposition, or ideology. I have not experienced trafficking myself, but these survivors have, and their stories have made a lasting impression on me. I think it is imperative that the distinguished members of this committee understand the import and urgency reflected in the physical and mental health needs of survivors. I am not a medical expert, but as a licensed mental health clinician with advanced degrees in clinical psychology, I am considered an expert in the mental health needs of victims and the efficacy of victim-centered care. I have worked with survivors who have been enslaved for days, months, or years. It is rare that traffickers will allow their victims to receive any health care during the period of enslavement. A more common occurrence is that after victims are rescued or escape, they come into contact with service providers. Case management programs are tasked with, the assessment, with assessment and referral as well as providing practical support. It is their job to assist the survivor in determining what a trafficked person needs in all areas. If the screening assessment of case management programs reveals the need for health care services, referrals are made. A victim-centered approach means that all necessary information and options are provided to the survivor who then makes decisions for him or herself. The age range of trafficked persons is staggering, from very young children to elderly persons. All are vulnerable to serious health consequences. To illustrate, I would like to cite a few examples from my experience. Two teenagers were forced to work in a brothel, and I was introduced to them the day after their escape when they went through the back door of a clinic the trafficker had taken them to when one became ill and couldn't work. They told me they had been subjected to multiple sex acts without condoms and were fearful of disease. The young woman with the infection told me she was not given medication. This seemed odd to me, and upon further questioning, she did produce a crumpled up prescription. Due to the language issues, she hadn't understood that this was an order for medication. Another group of teenage girls were brought into this country and forced to work as bar girls. This included commercial sex acts and rape for many of them. One became pregnant and was given liquid and pills by the trafficker to force a miscarriage. These means were not effective until late in the pregnancy when after repeated forced ingestion of this so-called medication, she endured a very painful and dangerous forced abortion at the hands of the traffickers. The other women were coerced into observing her and instructed that the same thing could happen to them. The young woman was then subjected to psychological torture by being forced to keep the result of the late-term miscarriage in close physical proximity for several days. When the young women from this case were finally rescued, this individual was hospitalized for physical and psychiatric care. She was suicidal and remained in care for several years to deal with the trauma of the abuse of the traffickers, the painful forced abortion without medical care, and the resulting situation. Another survivor who was older had been forced to work as a domestic servant for up to six years. She was repeatedly raped by her employer, her employer's son, and some friends of the employers. At no time were condoms used. When she was finally free, she told these experiences to the case manager and was referred to a clinic for a complete gynecological workup. The clinic staff determined that because of longstanding untreated STDs, she had sustained permanent damage and probable loss of fertility. 
The case manager had to provide support and seek counseling for this woman to help her deal with this devastating diagnosis. Those of us in this room cannot know the feeling of individuals forced into degrading and physically and mentally dangerous situations like those I have just described. We cannot imagine the stress of knowing something is wrong but being powerless to get help, to get information, to get treatment, to get care. These crimes are taking place here in our country to our citizens and to others who have come here in pursuit of a better life. Our laws are designed to protect and punish. The TVPA has done much to aid in the care and protection of victims and the prosecution of traffickers. The law states that victims are entitled to social services. This must include the full range of services in order to mitigate the harm of what has occurred. In Ms. Spirit, Ms. Burke, Ms. Burke, I see you have many more pages and you are already two minutes not too over. Many. Can you, can you wrap up? Your, like I say, you are heading toward twice the allotted time, if you don't mind. Okay. Thank you. Yes, sir. Um, we must provide information um, about, and people will make their own choices. We must protect them, not punish them further by withholding options that might aid in their recovery and health. I was going to speak about the HHS grants. I am sure we will get, we'll get to that. Okay. I, I appreciate it. Your entire record is placed in the record. And, Thank you. And trust me, it will be cited many times in the days to come. Okay. Ms. Powell. Thank you. Chairman, Chairman, Issa, uh, Chairman Issa, Representative Cummings, and Oversight Government Reform Committee members, staff, and others who are here today, I appreciate and am honored to have the opportunity to speak to you about the complexities of the social service needs of human trafficking victims here in the United States. I would particularly like to thank both Chairman Issa and Representative Cummings for their dedication to the needs of victims of human trafficking, including victims of forced labor and sexual servitude. Since the passage of the Trafficking Victims Protection Act in 2000, the United States Congress has advanced policies to ensure that victims of this horrible crime of human trafficking are offered comprehensive services that are designed to protect their rights and restore their dignity. I am the co-founding executive director of FAIR Girls, formerly known as FAIR Fund. We are a nonprofit agency based here in Washington, D.C. We have offices and programs in Bosnia, Montenegro, Serbia, Russia, and Uganda. We serve adolescent girls between the ages of 11 and 21 to provide them both prevention education and long-term compassionate care so that they can stay safe from or overcome situations of sex trafficking, forced labor, and other forms of exploitation. But the majority of our clients who have been trafficked for labor and all of our clients who have been sold for sex have been raped, resulting in serious medical and emotional trauma. It is for them that I am acting as their voice today before you. In addition to our direct services, Fair Girls offers prevention education and training to social service providers and law enforcement and others who should be able and are able to identify victims of trafficking. I wanted to make four key points and then I am going to elaborate on some of the case examples that I shared in my original written testimony. First, I would like to state that all victims of human trafficking need medical services, particularly women and girls forced into traf sex trafficking situations. Second, victims of human trafficking are denied this medical treatment during their enslavement, thus making access to immediate medical care critical and urgent, and frankly, one of the very first things that we do as an agency. Third, and I think this is very important to keep in mind, victims of forced labor trafficking also need medical attention for harm as a result of hazardous labor, long hours, and in some cases, sexual abuse and rape by their traffickers. Their traffickers do not look at the situation as, I'm only trafficking for a certain purpose. If they believe they own an individual, particularly a vulnerable child, they are going to do whatever they want with them, and that often includes rape. Finally, service providers for victims of trafficking are there to restore the dignity and freedom of our clients. We are not there to prescribe any type of judgment or to force our own opinions and beliefs on our clients. We are there to be, if you will, the door to open them to dignity and restoring their life as they would like to live it. 
I wanted to speak just a bit to the complexities of the issue of human trafficking. Under the TVPRA, the definition of the severe forms of human trafficking is categorized into two areas, labor trafficking and sex trafficking. I'd like to point out, while forced labor trafficking always needs to have the element of proving forced fraud and coercion, any young person under the age of 18 induced to commit a commercial sex act, whether they are seemingly giving consent or not, is automatically considered a victim of sex trafficking. Traffickers prey upon the vulnerability of victims. And in fact, when we do outreach education to kids in the schools here in the D.C. area, we have them learn two main, two main words, vulnerability and exploitation. Traffickers know who to take advantage of. Victims are predominantly already victims of exploitation, poverty, homelessness, and other forms of abuse. I now want to share a few of our case examples that I believe are very important. Two years ago, we were reached out to by a local hospital that had one of our outreach brochures. They had identified a teenage girl who they believed to be pregnant, uh, who they also believed to be a victim of trafficking. We found out that her trafficker was able to sell her to up to 20 men a night by utilizing online website advertising companies like Backpage and Craigslist. Therefore, she was being forced to be raped and exploited day in and day out to the point that she wasn't allowed to eat or sleep. This young woman, when she came to us, did in fact appear to be pregnant. We were able to get her a full medical assessment that day, and we found out that instead of being pregnant, her trafficker had stuck a kitchen sponge inside her body to keep her from bleeding during menstruation. It had grown to the size of a football, and the toxins inside her body nearly killed her. Had we not had the capacity and the resources that we pulled together from our own agency's general fund to protect this young woman, it is very likely that she would have died in the next few days. In another case to illustrate the connection between labor trafficking and the importance of reproductive health care, we had a young woman come to us um, a couple of years ago who was a victim of forced labor trafficking. We noticed as she was speaking to us in the initial assessment that she was holding her arms in a very protective way. Eventually she showed us all of the bruises and the scrapes and the battering that had gone on her arms and her back. What had happened was her trafficker had beaten her several times because she had fallen asleep on the job. The wounds had become infected because the clothing had become embedded inside of her wounds. She also had been raped multiple times by the owner of the establishment as well as many of the friends. This young woman suffered several sexually transmitted diseases and many more emotional and mental health scars that we cannot even begin to understand as we are not ourselves in that situation. I'd like to finally summarize with one key point. In the United States, many of us are well aware that when there is a victim of rape, not just sex trafficking, but any type of victim of rape, the first thing that we think is they need to get to the doctor. They need an assessment. What is the injuries? Do they have sexually transmitted diseases? Law enforcement take them there. Social service providers take them there. It's become the norm. It's very important to understand that when a victim of trafficking is forced to have sex, this is also rape. It should also be the norm that any young person, old person, anyone who's a victim of trafficking should have the access that they need to make sure that they get an entire medical workup so that they can get on with recovering as well as make sure that they address any long-term consequences. I appreciate the opportunity today to speak before you, and there are many more stories that I would like to share as I believe passionately in the rights of the young people that we serve at my agency, and I am very open to questions. Thank you. Thank you both for your testimony. Uh, because of the nature of today, I'm going to ask the ranking member to go first. I'll hold uh, my questions probably until the very end as part of a summary. And with that, I recognize the ranking member for his questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Ms. Powell and Ms. Burke, thank you uh, for being with us today. Uh, I've heard these victim stories, and they are indeed heart-wrenching, and they have been horribly exploited, and I commend you both for you know, the work that you are doing. Let me pose a, a fundamental question and let you respond. Your organizations both, both work with these victims directly, so you have, you have this firsthand experience with their needs, as well as understanding of the treatment and services that work. Ms. Burke, can you please uh, tell us uh, why, in your opinion, it is so important to ensure that these victims have access to referrals for re reproductive health care services? I think from the uh, case examples that the two of us have given, it is obvious uh, 
the critical needs that the trafficking victims present when uh, service providers meet them. Um, whether they have been enslaved uh, in sex trafficking or labor trafficking, it is a uh, common occurrence that rape is used as a means of control and exploitation. And when um, sexually transmitted disease or uh, untreated infections are allowed to go on, permanent damage, health damage can go on, not only to cause harm to them but to, to others. And um, contraception is almost never provided by a trafficker, and yet these young women and older women are expected to um, endure rape uh, 10, 20 times a day. Uh, without any kind of protection or medical care. And so we feel that it is so important that people be given information. And what service providers do is provide a referral to people who are experts in providing education, information, and services so that uh, survivors can make informed choices for themselves. They have had all ability to make a choice about anything taken away from them by the traffickers, and we need to restore this sense of personal freedom and choice about what is good for them and what they will pursue. Ms. Powell, what about you, the organization? Absolutely. I believe that it is very important for all victims of human trafficking, regardless of what type of trafficking, to have immediate access to the reproductive health services and full range of medical services that they need. In fact, just yesterday, I was sitting before a new client, and within the first five minutes, she asked me if I could get her to a doctor as quickly as possible because she was terrified of the consequences of being forced to have sex with dozens of men a day. This is not something that happens just on occasion. It's not a rare occurrence. Every single client that comes to us, whether referred by law enforcement in the middle of the night or being someone that was referred to her, us by Child Protective Services, they all want and they all need this, ser this service. And furthermore, I would like to point out that I am not a medical professional. And most of my colleagues who are social service providers are also not medical professionals. Therefore, it is not in the best interest of our clients, nor is it ethical for us to presume what may or may not be going on with a client's mental uh, or physical health. It is absolutely important that we utilize our, the medical community to give that comprehensive services to the victims. Well, at the previous hearing, some committee members uh, suggested that organizations that receive taxpayer funds to help these victims should be allowed to prohibit these types of referrals. Ms. Burke, uh, you, you have a chance right now to talk directly to some of those members and make your case. Based on your experience, should these types of referrals be uh, prohibited? Uh, or If not, why not? I definitely feel that uh services need to be comprehensive. Our law allows for a victim-centered approach for protection, prevention, and prosecution, and we are not protecting victims if we are not referring them for a full range of services. Um, the early HHS grants, which first were awarded in 2001, um, were awarded directly to case management programs. And these grants provided for referrals for all necessary services without restrictions. It was not until 2006 when the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops received the contract that restrictions around reproductive health care would not allow these very same agencies that received initial funding to continue to provide the same inclusive referrals for care. And it is important to understand that HHS funding is often the only funding that a service program has. Um, the health and uh, well-being of clients was compromised when USCCB denied the ability of case management programs to refer for these services. Um, the restriction stands in the way of health and healing of countless victims and it denies the option of choice, something that had previously been denied by traffickers and enforcers. Thank you very much. I see my time. I thank the gentleman. The gentleman from Idaho, Mr. Labrador, for five minutes. See what happens when you come back early? 
I, I came back a little bit early. I yield my time to. Okay, would I'll go to the gentleman from uh, I'm, my brain's going South Carolina, Mr. Gowdy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I thank my uh, friend and colleague from Idaho, uh, Ms. Burke. Do you know what the composite score was for the Catholic bishops grant application? I really have no idea about the grant application process, All right, the scoring they had, process. They had the second highest composite score among all who applied for the grant. And I think the record will support that they had this grant or contract for a five-year time period. Um, I can't recall a single witness ever providing any evidence that any of the victims who were uh, helped by the Catholic bishops were dissatisfied with their uh, five-year tenure. So I think what strikes some of us, uh, and let me say at the outset, I, I'm a former state and federal prosecutor who um, has as little tolerance for crimes against any group, especially the voiceless and the defenseless, as anyone. So I, I appreciate and applaud what you all do on behalf of people who cannot uh, stand up for themselves. I, I, but I am concerned that an entity with a, with a sterling five-year track record of providing services also had the second highest composite score in a grant application and nevertheless was not awarded the grant. It just strikes me that they should have been disqualified. They should have been told up front, because of your religious views on abortion, you are not going to be eligible to apply for this grant. But to go through the ruse of letting them apply, have the second highest score, a five-year track record, and no complaints for victims, and then not award them the grant, just strikes some of us as being excessively politicized. What do you think? I really can't comment on the grant making process. I, I'm just All right, well, let me ask not aware, you. but I would like to address your, your question about victims' satisfaction or dissatisfaction, if I may. Okay. Um, you said that you have not heard any um, evidence of victim dissatisfaction with the work done under the USCCB contract. And I was that correct? Well, I, I asked the last panel that was before us if they had bothered to interview any of the victims to gauge their level of satisfaction, and they had not even gone through the process of interviewing the very people that were trying to help. I would like to address that, if I may. Okay. Um, I would like to try to. Um, I think that if you asked victims about a contract with USCCB, very frankly, I don't know that they would understand the nuances of that contract. Um, they are interested in the services that are being provided. They are seeking services from a case management agency. All right, well, let, let, it would be the providers who would express the satisfaction or dissatisfaction with the contracting restriction. Let, let me stop you there, because unfortunately, despite the, the very serious nature of this topic that we are discussing, we are limited to five minutes, you would have no aversion to the Catholic bishops being able to handle male human trafficking victims. So this would not be an issue. I, I, I assume, because of their sterling track record, that if HHS had, had the foresight to divide it between male and female victims. There is nothing disqualifying about the Catholic bishops with respect to male trafficking victims. I think that that would create a, a terribly awkward system of divisiveness and deciding who is a victim and who is not. But you can see the awkwardness of telling a denomination that has a long history of trying to help the weak, the poor, the disenfranchised groups that nobody else has been historically willing to help, to tell them that because of your religious views on this issue, you need not apply. Because the next thing that goes through my mind is, what if the Catholic bishops wanted to apply for an after-school grant that had nothing to do with human trafficking? It was just an after-school program, but they might have 
female participants in it, would they also be disqualified because of their religious views with respect to abortion? I, I'm trying to get you, I guess, to answer what HHS would not answer last time, which is their religious views have disqualified them. They need not apply for any HHS grants until they change their religious views. Well, I think that it is not about male and female, because I think that all victims of trafficking, sex trafficking, labor trafficking, are vulnerable to serious health consequences, sexually transmitted disease, et cetera. So dividing into gender would not solve this problem. What so we need we to do is be inclusive that all health services are available to all victims. So would the Catholic bishops be disqualified for applying for any grants with any demographic that could be even tangentially related to reproductive services? The gentleman's time has expired. You may answer, though. I am not sure that I can answer, because I am not, not in the position of making these grants. My overarching responsibility is to see that all that referrals for all health services can be made for victims. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman. We now recognize, uh, well, quite frankly, I think Mr. Quigley was the only one here at the start. Mr. Quigley, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Burke, Ms. Powell, again, thanks for the work you do and for those in your agencies for the work they do. Um, there were news stories uh, alluded to in the previous hearing which uh, uh, argued the following point, that uh, providing contraception to trafficking victims is sustaining prostitution, the argument being victims being trafficked right now cannot provide informed consent to an abortion or a regime of contraception because they are under control of a trafficker. If you do provide these services, all you are doing is perpetuating modern-day sex slavery. So the question for both of you is, is this correct? Does uh, providing contraceptive, contraceptives to survivors of a, a trafficking sustain or support prostitution? And based on your experiences on human trafficking, are, are victims capable of giving informed consent to family planning services? Sure. Fire away. Okay, I'll start. So. As a social service provider, we have never been in the position where we uh, were buying contraceptives for those who are currently being trafficked. I think one thing to kind of frame this discussion on is that when someone is a victim of human trafficking, they are in fact enslaved. None of the money is theirs. They have no agency. They eat when they are told to eat. They sleep when they are told to sleep. They wear what they are told to wear. They have absolutely no ability to make choices. And I'm using the word victim very, very confidently right now, because in that state, in that situation in which they are enslaved, they are a victim. However, when they are referred to us through law enforcement, when they escape or when they are rescued, when they come to us, they then go on this path of becoming a survivor. And part of being a survivor is having the ability to say what they need and when they need it and how they want to have that service provided to them. And it can be as simplistic as wanting a pair of socks to sleep in, and it can be as complex as legal services and medical services. Our job as a social service provider, in particular in those first 24 hours, is to really try to listen as clearly and without judgment as possible to what this individual needs. And that individual can be a 65-year-old man who is a victim of labor trafficking, and it can be a 16-year-old girl who is a victim of sex trafficking. Our job is to listen and to help them get access to those services. And we do everything in our power, given the resources and the size of our agency, to do that. I think you had a, a second part to your question well, that I maybe didn't answer. At that point of being the survivors, are they in your minds capable of informed consent on such decisions? Absolutely. Thank you, Ms. Burke. Yes, I would agree that uh, with, with proper uh, understanding of the language, if there is a, a second language issue, um, that information needs to be provided in the primary language of the survivor, first of all. 
and with proper education and information, certainly people uh, can make informed consent. They have to uh, have in informed consent to go through the criminal justice process. The key here is, as Ms. Powell said, that service providers are not providing contraception or other family planning services. We are making referrals for those things. Um, so your question about sustaining or supporting prostitution, um, I don't see the connection between the provision of contraception and uh, that concept. And, and with the limited time I have, um, how much you talk about the health care that you provide? Can you touch a little bit about the psychological capability, psychological care you can provide at that point? Currently, I don't provide direct services anymore. I'm a consultant, so I am involved in training about the the need for. Um, psychological experts to provide care for survivors. And this would, again, uh, be based on the needs of the individual, whether it needs to be some sort of cross-cultural counts sure. uh, cross counseling or uh, a group uh, mode of, of therapy, it, it um, depends on the individual. Mr. Chairman, if Ms. Powell could take with unanimous consent about 60 seconds to answer the same question, given the amount of time. You may answer the same question, please. Okay. So I, to answer your question, when a client comes to us, we have to make a very comprehensive assessment. And granted, we have very limited time in that first 24 hours to think about a variety of situations going on. There might be language competency issues at play, and certainly we work first and foremost to address that so that we make sure that everything that's going on is understood by this new survivor so that they are making the best decisions that they can make. We then try to figure out what other basic needs that they need to have met simultaneously so that they are feeling comfortable enough to express what they need. But we are not putting the words in their mouth. We are not pushing them toward doing something if they don't want to do it. We are doing everything in our power to hear what they need, and that might mean that they want to immediately get reproductive health services. It might just mean that they're hungry and they need some food, and they might just be tired and need to sleep first. And our counseling professional staff in all of our locations are skilled professionals who can make sure that they are helping that individual make the most um, important choices of their life in the way that they believe that they would like to make them. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. We now go to the gentleman from South Carolina, Mr. Gowdy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's my pleasure to uh, yield my time to my friend and colleague from Idaho, Mr. Labrador. Thank you very much to the gentleman from South Carolina. Uh, Ms. Powell, I just I want to thank both of you, actually, for the work you do. I, I was not a prosecutor, but I was actually a criminal defense attorney, and I have uh, dealt with some, some of the issues that you are dealing with, and I know how hard it is. I do have some questions, though. Uh, according to your testimony, Ms. Powell, your organization offers each of its clients individualized care. Uh, including counseling, advocacy, referrals for housing, legal and medical services. What percentage of your uh, clients request counseling? Most of them request counseling. I don't have an exact percentage. Uh, approximate. Most you say close to 100 percent. I'd say 85 to 90 percent. What about advocacy? It depends on whether or not they have been arrested as a result of their trafficking. That might be something that they need support for or if they need support uh, around immigration issues. But um, I'm going to say more like 40 percent. We actually also serve domestic minor victims of sex trafficking, and sometimes advocacy for them looks pretty different than someone who is a foreign national victim. What about housing? Pretty much all of them need housing, and that is a big challenge. And legal? It, it really depends. I would say about half. And medical? Almost all of them, I'd say 98 percent, need some type of medical care referrals from us within the first 48 hours. Okay, you also state that their medical needs include the treatment of STDs, right. serious gyne gynecological illnesses, including cancer, 
kidney damage due to untreated STDs. Uh, these treatments are all within what the U.S. Catholic uh, bishops do, uh, and they would be willing to provide, but they don't, they don't refer uh, or wish to refer for abortions. How many of your clients actually ask for services dealing with abortion? When our clients ask for referrals for reproductive health care, it is usually within the first 24 hours of us meeting them, and it is often that they would like to discover. It is not that they know whether or not they are pregnant or that they know whether or not that they have an STD. So by and large, they are asking for a referral so they can figure out what the damage is to their body and what they are going to have to do to recover moving forward. Do you pay for their medical services? Luckily, we have a community health clinic here in the D.C. area that offers the initial consultations pro bono while we figure out other remedies for payment. On occasion, we have had to pay for medications, though. So if, if you look at all the services that you provide, are you willing to say that providing abortion services is the most important of all the services that, that you provide? It is very important that we are able to provide the full range of reproductive and medical services that our clients need. I understand, I but we are talking about a lot of different services. And if one organization provides all the other services exceptionally well, but does not provide one service and is willing to, to send people out to, to provide those services, don't you think they are doing a good uh, service to the community? So my understanding is that for an organization to be able to provide comprehensive services for victims of trafficking would actually, in fact, mean just that. It would have to be the full range and be comprehensive. So if they are not providing referrals for this one particular service, then they aren't, in fact, comprehensive. Well, that is this administration's interpretation. But the Catholic bishops has, has been doing this for five years without providing the comprehensive services. And in fact, they, when they were rated, because you know, there, there was a rating that were, when they were rated, they were actually came in with the second highest score. When you looked at the overall uh, responsibility that they had, not just at this one particular uh, thing. So when they are the second best agency providing the services, all the other services that we are talking about, don't you think it is a disservice? Um, that we are not allowing, that, that we are not uh, um, using a, an organization like that, that is actually doing everything else pretty well? To be honest, I really only have one interest. And my interest is not the Catholic bishops and it is not the grant process. It is to make sure our clients have comprehensive services. As a very small agency that chose not to subcontract Correct. with any government contracts with HHS, we did this because we wanted the freedom to make sure that we could provide comprehensive services for our clients. I can tell you firsthand this is not easy, cobble, cobbling together the resources no. and making sure that while you are internally panicking as to how you are going to pay for this, that you are smiling at your client saying, it is okay, honey. We are going to be fine and thinking, am I going to explain this to the board that I just paid for this? <laughs> and so it is a very tricky process. And I think that anyone who is providing comprehensive services has to do just that. We can't pick and choose and part and parcel. We have to do this holistically, just as we would other victims of sex crimes and other forms of exploitation. And, and my understanding is that they do it holistically as well. They just don't pay for, for the services, but they will refer to to medical uh, providers to do any kind of service that needs to be done. But thank you very much for being here today. I thank the gentleman. We now go to the gentleman from Brooklyn, New York, I believe. I, 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 don't, I think Mr. Quigley and Mr. Cummings were the only ones here at the start. Oh, I apologize. Uh, you were here. You were so quiet. I missed you. I my, my, then we have the yielding program here. No, no, forget about that I, yielding I thing. I'm not, I'm not missing a chance to, to make amends. <laughs> I now recognize with great pleasure the gentlelady from the District of Columbia, in which we are all thankful to be, for five minutes. At the moment. <laughs> uh, I, I thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate this hearing. Um, my colleague on the other side, um, in, indicated if you are second best at providing some of the services, that ought to be enough, even if they are not all of the services that are needed. I say if you are first best in providing some of the services, but those are not all of the services 
that the clients need, uh, that, that is not good enough. If I go to a doctor and he says, I'm, I'm real good at doing X, but you need X and Y, he's not good for me. Now, he also listed the services. He went down the services. Did you notice that contraception was not on that list? And I don't know why this discussion has gone off entirely on abortion. I recognize how critical that is. But it is important to get on the record that once the bishops had the contract, that these, uh, these clients who had, who had been involved in trafficking, for whom sex had be become a way of life, were not even able to be referred for contraception. Let us understand what we're talking about. Even if you are trafficking and you don't want an abortion, you don't believe in abortion. After the bishops got the contract, you could not be referred even for contraception, even though you have been involved in sex uh, exchanges all your life. Do understand that going off on abortion hides what we know every single person who has been involved in the life of trafficking will need, and that is some way <laughs> to protect him or herself. Am I exaggerating the importance of contraception or the need to provide contraception services, which were left entirely off of that list that my colleague provided? I'd like to know something about contraception, uh, contraceptive services and the importance uh, 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 of providing them or not providing them to this, to this uh, set of clients. I don't think that uh, you're exaggerating at all. Uh, I think that the referral for contraception and emergency contraception is of vital importance for survivors of human trafficking for all the reasons that we've listed. And when USCCB got the contract in 2006, programs were no longer allowed to refer for the full range of reproductive health. Um, you know, some, some of my colleagues accused uh, those, some of us on, on this side who believe people should have the full range of services, including contraception and abortion of, of uh, anti-Catholic bias, even though I believe this was entirely refuted by the record which showed the Catholic Church had received $650 million in funding uh, in the last three years, uh, more than they had received under the prior administration. Uh, and I do want to say for the record, the framers really did have this thing right. Um, it is as if you can get the public dollar, the taxpayer money, and continue to practice your religion using taxpayer dollars as you please, regardless of the needs of the clients. Um, there's no entitlement to a contract in this country. Um, I want to. I want to ask about. I, I want to ask about the before the bishops had the contract. Before the bishops had the contract, Ms. Burke, were you able to provide the services, uh, contraception and abortion? We were able to provide the referrals for the services. That's what I mean. Yes. So. When the bishops no longer had the contract, all that was happening is that you were going back to the status quo ante, how it had been before. When you were, when, when the bishops no longer had the contract, you were able to provide the services. Once they got the contract, you were, you were not. Correct. Um, now, under the bishop's rest restrictions, pa passing out public money, how did the subcontractor organization? I'd ask unanimous consent. The gentlelady have another thirty seconds. I appreciate, it, Mr. Chairman. Under the bishop's restrictions, if you needed, you believe somebody needed contraception, I would say that would be everybody. But forgive me if I think that, but needed contraception or needed abortion, uh, how would you assure that the client received those services?
for some programs there were other sources of funding that were not tied to the contract subcontract with usccb and those programs could utilize that funding well suppose you were a subcontractor of the bishops for programs who were subcontractors with the bishops and that was the only source of their funding yes that meant that case managers who work really long hours at very low pay had to spend extra time uncompensated time uncompensated time trying to find a service that would provide um, contraception for con example contraception for example thank you very much mr chairman i thank the gentleman we know we now go to the gentleman from pennsylvania uh, are you Mr. Chairman, thank you. Uh, I don't have any questions, but I appreciate both uh, witnesses for being here, and especially your written testimony, because I'm running between meetings, but glad to have your written testimony that I'm able to take with me and appreciate your work. And would the gentleman yield? I'd be glad to, Mr. Chairman. I thank you. Uh, let me go through a few questions, because I've developed some questions while this has been going on. Uh, Ms. Burke, Ms. Powell, uh, these questions will be sort of for both of you. Do both of you have places that you could refer an indigent to get contraception? at no cost to them. I mean, it's pretty straightforward. Do you, you, have, you have a way outside of Federal funds to get contraception for people in general, for women in general? It's a, kind of an easy yes or no. We have a You have other resources. You said you scrapped together with very little money. I assume you have that. Is that right? Right. So we are predominantly using pro bono services from the medical community. Okay. Do you also have, if no other source is available, the uh, ability to, f to get an abortion for somebody in need if no funds are available? If we can find a referral for the medical services a client needs, then, then we can make that referral. But if we don't have the... No, I understand that. Uh, and I will get to the referral in a second. I am sort of building to that. Mm -hmm. uh, and we will... We'll, in our earlier hearing, I don't think either of you were probably necessarily in the audience, but there were three services, which you are acutely aware of them, sterilization, contraception, and abortion. Uh, and abortion under Federal law, we are only talking about rape, incest, and life of the mother. We are not talking about just because somebody is pregnant under Federal law. Is that correct? Okay. Uh, so <clears throat> we are talking about a narrow constraint, but it doesn't really matter. Those are the three procedures out of 200 medical procedures. Did the Catholic bishops prevent you from referring somebody to a doctor for gynecological examination, including STDs and the, the other full range of things that can happen to somebody who has been the victim of rape? Yes. They did? Yes. What, other than abortion, contraception, and sterilization, what procedures did they prohibit you from referring to a doctor for? kidney disease, uh, cancer, STDs, were any of those prohibited? No. Okay. So you said there yes, but you, what is the yes? What, what, other than those three, did they prohibit? In other words, the same uh, gynecological exam is going to go on for all of these. So I just so I understand, you send somebody for a health care referral. You were not prohibited from sending them to somebody who could refer for an abortion, you, because you didn't have to send to a Catholic doctor. Uh, you, you sent to people, I assume, who could come back and say the woman is pregnant or the, uh, or the woman needs contraception for some reason, right? You just couldn't physically get it paid for by the bishops, is that right? It's still the same doctor, isn't it? I'm, ask, I'm asking this for a question, and I'll, I'll get to the question rather than run you through questions you're uncomfortable answering. We are not concerned about abortion here today. We're concerned about a contract. So let me go through the, the whole point. Had HHS said that, in fact, there was another program outside of the Catholic bishops, and that under that site fund, if a physician who you referred for a full range of examination, because often you didn't send somebody in knowing they were pregnant. The, the poor woman with a sponge you thought was pregnant, she wasn't pregnant, and ultimately you still referred her. So 
if you sent somebody in and there was a site that said, if it comes back in these three categories by the doctor, that referral goes to this site fund of Federal dollars, Ms. Powell, something similar to when you had uh, the State Department uh, funding directly that you had. If you had been had another site fund, you would have been able to refer them under that other site fund. Is that correct? Just as you could have referred them under pro bono work. Is that right? We would probably be able to cobble together different resources to do that. Okay. But I am saying, no, if the Federal Government had given you these resources mm -hmm. and simply given it to you on another site fund, provided it under the contract uh, to everybody, you would have had a site fund. You could have done it. You weren't prohibited from having multiple contracts. And the reason I am asking this is we asked HHS, did they try a workaround? They said no. We went to the Catholic bishops and told them to offer us one. This committee is in no small part concerned about differences on the, I'm sorry, on the abortion issues, but we are also concerned on the contracting. So in the future contract, if Catholic bishops or any group for any reason has any concern, if there is an effective workaround, and it appears as though there was an effective workaround, or at least it could have been explored, as people dealing with people in need, you would have used the multiple site funds or the free over here or the clinic over here that you testified earlier to, wouldn't you, to provide all those services? Because the, the, the Catholic bishops were not providing the services. They were doing referral and administration, right? Sounds like a really complicated um, process, and I'm not as familiar with the different types of contracting that you're referring to. Well, you're very, and my his time has expired, but you're you're very familiar with cobbling together money to get what you want. True. Okay, you have cobbled it together. Our problem here on the dais is we have a law that prohibits religious beliefs from making somebody ineligible, and yet we didn't have any attempt to work around. So that is why the question, I, I, I apologize for going over, and uh, I guess now I am going to the former chairman of the full committee who has been very patiently waiting, the gentleman from Brooklyn, Mr. Towns. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Let me thank you and the ranking uh, committee uh, chair to, for having this uh, hearing. Uh, I would like to read into the record um, a statement that was submitted by another survivor of human trafficking who is on the verge of success with her life. Her story is one of sadness, uh, but also one of hope. We can use hers and, and other examples as we continue to examine what services are made available for victims of human sex trafficking and who is capable of providing the services that are necessary to transition back to a normal life as possible. And let me, um, uh, this is from um, Asia Graves, uh, who is 24 years old, college student, who is going to school for political science with a legal studies concentration. When I was 17 years old, she said, I was a victim of human trafficking. I was living with my mother, who was addicted to crack cocaine. For safety reasons, I moved in with my father, who was an alcoholic. I did not know my life would turn upside down. My dad requested that I pay $900 a month in rent. I got a job working as many hours as, as I could to try and pay my rent. I even missed school. When I could not pay my rent, my father threw me out. Uh, so with no place to go, I moved in with a group of girls who were staying in a one-bedroom apartment. They introduced me to several of their male friends who I didn't know were pimps. I was told I was going to on a date, but instead I was taken to the track, a street corner in the middle of a snowstorm, and left there. They told me that I had to have sex with these men for money or I would be homeless. I didn't do it. And on my walk home, I met a guy who appeared to be my age. He told me that I was beautiful and I could go home with him. He took care of me and gave me a place to live. After a week, he told me that he was a pimp and I was his property. He called an escort service who took naked pictures of me and put them on their website. Men came to the hotel and had sex with me. I was told that if I did not have sex with them, they would kill me. 
Two weeks later, he took me to the track and made me work. He said that I, if I did not, he would kill my family. He sold me to several other pimps that had sex with me and forced me to have sex with other men. After being beaten, hit in the head with an iron and sexually assaulted with a hairbrush and figuring out that I was pregnant, I had enough. I tried to run but was held hostage at gunpoint. When I finally escaped, I spoke to the first police officer that I could find that led to my traffickers' retaliation against me. The next morning, my traffickers sent four women with steel-toed Timberland boots to assault me. Uh, they knew that I was pregnant, so they focused their kicks on my face and stomach. Uh, they left me on the sidewalk like a piece of garbage. I walked to the nearest police station and spoke to a police officer who sent me to Sergeant Kelly O'Connell. Uh, she knew who my trafficker was. During our interview, I started to miscarry. She took me to the emergency room. I was afraid to go to the hospital for the fear that I wouldn't be seen due to lack of health insurance. They made sure that even though I did not have health insurance, I was taken care of. After that, I did not know what to do or who to turn to. Thankfully, I was blessed to have a group of investigators who helped me physically and emotionally. I was also referred to Carol Gomez, director, of course, of, uh, and, and she who worked as my victim advocate, uh, mentor, and counselor. Without her, I would have not been able to receive mental health treatment or PTSD, physical as well as dental health to fix several teeth that were broken by my traffickers. I never went to a doctor during that period of my life, during my life when I was being held hostage by my pimps. Thankful since I got out of the situation and have had access to doctors, I have not tested uh, positive for a sexual transmission uh, disease. I, I was and am still scared of not knowing whether I really am disease free. I, can I get another 30 seconds? Uh, yeah. I, had a, I had a close friend who caught full-blown AIDS from her pimp. She has died recently. Once I got help from Carol, I was grateful to be able to have information about and access to contraceptions and condoms to, have, to make sure I stayed healthy and to protect my partners. Carol also took me to the doctor to make sure my sexual health was in good standing. I am relatively healthy, but doctors don't know yet if I will ever be able to have children as a result of the beatings and assaults I suffered. And had, and had I not miscarried, right after I escaped my traffickers, Carol would have given me information about options on pregnancy. She would have helped me access prenatal care or abortion services, depending on what I decided was best for me. I owe Carol everything thanks to her and what she did for me. Once I escape my trafficker, I am nearing college graduation. I plan to attend law school so that one day I will be able to advocate for women who are going through what I went through. We need programs to help provide us with services, and we need to make sure we get all of the service we need. Thank both of you for coming to testify and for the work that you are doing. Uh, we appreciate it. I want you to know you are making a difference in the lives of so many. Thank you. I thank the gentleman. We now go to the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Connolly, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and I want to thank particularly Mr. Cummings, the ranking member, for um, requesting this hearing um, so that we could actually hear from the providers uh, of services to victims of human trafficking um, uh, as sort of a follow-up to the earlier hearing. And um, assertions to the contrary notwithstanding, uh, in the first hearing we had on the subject, from my point of view, uh, the witness we had, Mr. Sheldon in particular, uh, made it very clear uh, that there was no politicization uh, or anti-religious bias in the decision not to award this particular contract of services to victims of human trafficking to the U.S. Catholic bishops. In fact, the record made very clear that the U.S. Catholic bishops received several grants subsequent to the denial of this one, 
and that the Catholic uh, Church, Catholic entities, including Catholic Charities, including Catholic Relief Service, receive hundreds of millions of dollars of U.S. taxpayer assistance because of the wonderful work they do, whether it be internationally or domestically. So the smear, the suggestion that there is a bias against my church um, is false. The question came down to what the nature of the grant was, what services were to be provided. Mr. Sheldon gave, I thought, eloquent testimony uh, before this committee that we know more now about the victims of human trafficking and that one of the essential services, absolutely essential, and I am going to ask you whether you concur, but uh, in terms of services for the victims, most of whom are women, often young girls, who have been multiply you know, uh, abused sexually, raped, uh, physically mistreated, are gynecological services, precisely the services the U.S. Catholic bishops, as a matter of conscience, chose not to provide. That is their right. But if that is the nature of the services needed and that is the nature of the grant designed, then you give it to somebody who can and will provide those services. It was a fairly straightforward proposition, not politicized at all until it came to this committee. Now, I want to know, uh, if I may, Ms. Burke and Ms. Powell, from your point of view, is it essential that the full range of gynecological services be provided to the victims who would be served by such grants? I can't stress enough how important I think it is that the full range of services be available, that service providers be able to refer for these services. It has been borne out in, in years of experience um, on my behalf that there it is not just contraception, abortion, or other services, but it is the education that goes along with it, that victims are often young, victims are often undereducated, victims are often uh, come with a different primary language um, and don't really understand their own sexual health. They don't understand the functions of their body, and they are very vulnerable to um, illness and disease, and we wouldn't consider not referring clients who suffer from a diagnosis of cancer, diabetes, or, or um, heart disease, and yet it's been the practice of the last five years to prohibit referrals for reproductive health care that also helps to halt disease and prevent long-term well, health issues. Thank you, Ms. Burke. Ms. Powell, wh why? I mean, what is the harm in skipping that part? It is absolutely critical that we have the ability and we must be able to provide comprehensive referrals for all forms of reproductive health needs. And I would like to build upon what Why? <laughs> why is it important? You just assert it is important, but why is it important? It is important for their lives. It is not just about whether or not we think they might need it these individuals absolutely need the ability to have these referrals. Just like the example that I gave of the young woman who had a kitchen sponge the size of a football in her stomach, she would have died had we not been able to get her to care. And this is not the only scenario that was like this. It's a very common tactic of traf traffickers to put a foreign object in a woman's body or a girl's body so that he can maximize his profit by using her even during menstruation. So, so, so if I understand you correctly, this isn't just a matter of, well, I don't, I, as a matter of conscience, I don't really like that, so I'm going to make a little exception and not provide that service. Absent that kind of service, we might, unintentionally, of course, actually be jeopardizing lives. Right. And as a service provider, I can't be in that position. I must be able to provide my clients to all of the services that they need. Thank you. My time is up. Mr. Chairman, might I also ask that a letter uh, from Catholics for Choice, addressed to the ranking member, Mr. Cummings, uh, be entered into the record at this time. They didn't send one to me. Pardon me. Uh, I don't know. You know, they sent one to me. I don't know whether they sent one. I'm to shocked. Me. I'm shocked. Uh, 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 yes, without objection, Mr. Chairman, be included. Knowing in how hurt your feelings chairman, are, I'll make sure they one. send you one. Thank, I thank. I thank the former chairman. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. And I'll uh, I'll combine a close with with my five minutes. Uh, you have been helpful today. Uh, this, uh, this hearing was one 
that uh, uh, I told the ranking member I wanted to have anyway, uh, although his insistence made a huge difference in how fast we had it. I want to go through a couple of things. Uh, Ms. Powell, uh, have you had any other contracts, uh, Federal contracts or subcontracts uh, other than the State Department? Did you do any work under the Catholic bishops? We have not done any work with the Catholic bishops, no. Okay. So you don't have any direct knowledge of what they would or wouldn't do? My case manager and uh, program director worked for another agency, and she has given me multiple examples, but I personally don't have direct knowledge. Okay. Well, we don't have her to here today, so that is why I am asking. Ms. Burke, you haven't done any work with the Catholic bishops under any Federal contract, have you? Not since 2007. Okay. Uh, let me ask you a couple of questions uh, that are to sort of clear up things that I didn't hear asked or answered. Uh, Catholic bishops pay for well baby treatment? Did they, did, would they provide uh, pregnant mothers with uh, healthy exams to help with making sure their baby was delivered uh, in a healthy way? In other words, did pregnant women under the Catholic bishops get referred to anybody? I am assuming they didn't just deny them health care. No. So I, I... They, would deny, they would allow them to have the baby get an ultrasound? The mother get an ultrasound of the baby? I think so, yes. So they'd, they would have found that sponge, right? Or found that it wasn't a baby? I just want to make the point that maybe people would misunderstand in this hearing and think that that woman with a sponge inside her body would die under Catholic bishops' care, and it doesn't appear as though they would have. If someone thought she was pregnant, she still would have gotten a referral. It would not have been a referral to get an abortion, but it would have been a referral for normal, healthy normal questions, especially if the baby didn't kick and she kept swelling, right? We had about two hours with our client before we made that referral because she was in so much pain. Um, okay. Let's follow up on that. Catholic bishops' administration, the people they paid to do it for them, Ms. Burke maybe before 2007, if a woman was in, in pain, you just, you, Ms. Burke, you, you, that woman in pain with a sponge in her, in her, in her uh, 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 uterus or wherever it was trapped, she would have gone to the hospital under the Catholic bishops, wouldn't she? You wouldn't have been prohibited from taking a woman in pain to the hospital even if she was distended and looked like she was pregnant. No, we wouldn't. Okay. I, I just want to make the point, because I think it's important, that there are differences perhaps in what they administered. But I think there is no question, and I've, I sometimes object with Catholic charities, Catholic priests, Catholic everything. Um, they willingly and knowingly house illegal immigrants. They provide all kinds of around the government because they are so caring and so liberal that they don't recognize U.S. borders. So I am not going to tell you that the Catholic Church is, is perfect at all times. They have been part of sanctuaries for people who they knew were not here legally and they didn't care. That is part of how compassionate they are. So certainly no administrator on behalf of the, the bishops would have denied health care that they thought was life-threatening to, to somebody. They would have gotten them to the doctor. You can all agree to that, can't we? Okay. In closing, I understand, Ms. Powell, you, you thought it was cumbersome if the contract had been let differently. But if I told you what the first hearing told us, which was it is illegal to deny them based on their religious beliefs, and it is, in fact, true that the contract never said you will be denied this contract because you do not offer abortion, sterilization, or birth, or, uh, birth control pills and the like, that the contract had a certain flaw. You have testified today, both of you, that what you call the full range of health care, and we call the last three of 200 that are listed. But suffice to say, they don't provide those, those as a matter of conscience. The contract implied that they could win, and they got an 89, and somebody with a 69 got the contract instead. So I think you would all agree, you both I hope would agree, that the, flaw, the process of letting them go through the bidding and then not receive it was inherently flawed because, if I understand correctly, you think that, uh, and I am not disagreeing with you, I am just asking, you think that, in fact, it should have been a, look, if you don't do it, you don't get the contract, right? That is what you have testified to, pretty much. Okay. That is one of the challenges, and I will close now. 
for this committee is to figure out how the grant process can be honest and legal up front so that nobody enters knowing that there is a trap door at the end, and so that from the remaining people who were ever eligible, they receive contracts in a fair and impartial fashion. The term competitive grant always bothers me when I find out that the competition at the end of it all is somebody's individual decision. So I want to thank you for your testimony. I think it was illustrative far beyond just the question of grant process. I think you have both been excellent witnesses, and uh, I thank you for your being here. I have no doubt that Congress will look to have you back on this subject, including perhaps this committee. And we stand adjourned.